Hello, good evening. Thanks for joining us for the API's Iron Government. This presentation brings you an in-depth look at the plans, programs, and policies of the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I'm Hala John. On this evening's program, we examine the role of the Ministry of National Mobilization during the explosive events at the La Soufre. St. Vincent and the Grenadines receives more relief supplies from our Latin counterparts. Then we bring you highlights from a recent virtual dance conference hosted by the Department of Culture. We'll bring you the details to these and other stories after News Watch with the API's Ashisia Sam. It's Thursday, June 10, 2021. Good evening and thank you very much for joining us on this edition of News Watch. I'm Ashisi Assam. Deputy Prime Minister Montgomery Daniel says the Georgetown Clinic and the Smart Hospital will be reopened on Monday, June 14, 2021. The two medical facilities, which are part of the Georgetown Modern Medical Complex, were closed since the first eruption of the Lassifer volcano on April 9. Daniel says the facility is being reopened to serve the people of the Georgetown area who have returned home more than a week ago. According to Daniel, the Modern Medical and Diagnostic Center building is 90% cleaned. But he acknowledges there is an issue with the roof that is delaying the reopening of the facility. The Deputy Prime Minister says the building is being assessed by two companies who will advise the government on the soundness of the medical facility. The Georgetown Modern Medical and Diagnostic Center was opened in July 2018 and offers a range of services to the Vincentian public, including dialysis treatment. The Organization of the American States, OAS, hosted a virtual meeting on Monday, June 7, on the topic, The Work of the OAS in the Region in Response to Climate Change and Natural Disasters and Building Resilience in the Face of These Challenges. The meeting was attended by disaster management agencies and government ministries in the OAS member states. Assistant Secretary General of the OAS, Ambassador Nesta Mendez, says the topic is the most pressing importance and urgency for Caribbean member states. Rising temperatures in recent years have contributed to severe natural disasters, including floods, drought, tropical storms, heat waves, wildfires, and volcanic activities. In spite of the challenges that have affected the nation of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, education is still at its optimum. This was proven when Marika Batiste of the Girls High School was declared winner of the U.S. Embassy's fourth annual Black History Month secondary school speech competition. Headmistress of the Girls High School, Michelle Beach, spoke of the young students' achievements. Our winner today, Ms. Marika Batiste, set the standard for hope among the young when from October last year she spoke at the National Secondary Schools Public Speaking Championship. Since that time, she has represented the school and her country in three other similar competitions and has excelled in them all. Today we celebrate with her and the students and teachers who mentored them. We thank the United States Embassy in Barbados for giving them the opportunity to shine and be included in their global vision of black history. The winner took home a prized package valued at 1,000 US dollars. Local advocacy group Voice of the Disabled has been awarded a grant of 23,000 US dollars to aid in the continued rehabilitation and development of the Voice of the Disabled Center. The grant was awarded through the Australian High Commission based in Trinidad and Tobago under their Direct Aid Program, DAP. 
President of the organization, Cheryl Adams, says that the project submitted to DAP was named Bringing Hope to Persons with Disabilities in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Adams says the hope is that the center will become a hub for activities which serve the disabled community. Some of the programs we are planning is to have craft from different types. We want to have independent living skills. We want to have home management. We want to have Braille and IT for those that are visually impaired and are interested in learning how to read Braille and how to use the computer. A sewing machine has also come with the project. So for our young ladies and even young men who want to do a little stitching or two, you can also do that. This center is going to become the home for persons with disability. Project coordinator Alan Williams made an appeal to other stakeholders to join with the voice of the disabled organization in the development of the center and their programs. So we're making a special appeal to other organizations within St. Vincent Grenadines, other donors, other friends of the community, churches, whosoever can give us a helping hand to make this center success so we can reach and help to reach the needs of persons within our community. Voice of the Disabled was established in October 2016 to advocate for people with disabilities in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And in our sports story, as round one of the CONCACAF World Cup qualifiers concluded, St. Vincent and the Grenadines senior men Vinci Heat weren't able to progress to the second round, having scored three points for their Group C matches. Vinci Heat, after their four games in the group stage, only won one match, but their OECS sister island, St. Kitts and Nevis, has topped their group and will move on to round two of the qualifiers to vie for a spot in the FIFA World Cup to be held in Qatar in 2022. The second round of the matches will take place on June 12 and 15. And here's where we end News Watch for this evening. I am Ashisia Sam inviting you to stay with us for the API's Eye on Government program. Coming up on this week's Inside Story, World Blood Donor Day, every job counts. Meet the team at Planned Parenthood, recognizing young talent at Stennett Joinery. These exciting stories await you on Inside Story, Saturday, June 12, 2021 on SVG TV at 5 p.m. Save the date. As we battle the unseen enemy, COVID-19. Remember to be kind to each other, be a good neighbor, help someone less fortunate than yourself, be your brother's keeper. Together, we can overcome COVID-19. A message by the National Reconciliation Advisory Committee. Diabetes is among the top three leading causes of death. Are you living with diabetes? If so, you may be at risk for developing complications, especially during this COVID pandemic. Let's tackle this problem by complying with taking your medication, increasing your physical activities, increasing eating a balanced and nutritious diet, checking your feet as foot care is important, and contacting your healthcare provider. Remember, diabetes can lead to blindness, amputation and numerous harmful and life-threatening effects. Protect yourself. Know your numbers. Hearts Movement SVG reminds you to love your body and treat it right. Your health is shared responsibility. Thanks for staying with us for this presentation by the Agency for Public Information. 
The Ministry of National Mobilization, Social Development, Family and General Affairs initiated a rapid response program to assist displaced persons during the explosive eruptions of the Lasso Frere volcano from early April 2021 to this day. The Ministry's assistance ranges from providing social support services to the most vulnerable to addressing the basic needs of evacuees at shelters. The API's Janice St. Phillips recently sat down with Lafleur Kwame, Acting Senior Assistant Secretary within the Ministry, to examine the organization's role during one of the most trying times in this nation's history. Here we gather today in this lovely environment, and we're here to speak on the Ministry's efforts what has been done or what will be done during uh, these challenging times. Of course, we've had to battle with COVID, um, dengue fever, as well as the recent explosive volcanic eruption. So in terms of evacuees, since many persons, particularly women and children, families, of course, had to move from their homes, what percentage of women were evacuees? Well, firstly, I must also say that in addition to our portfolio, we are also charged with the responsibility for children, women, um, persons with disabilities, and the elderly. And those are categorized as vulnerable. So from the time that the effusive eruption was announced by the Prime Minister on December 31st, it was our mandate to ensure that we have a number of these persons who would be affected by the La Sofre volcano if it was to become um, explosive. And from the census um, statistics, we would have identified that over 20,000 persons from the red and orange zones from the north, leeward and north windward mm -hmm. um, constituencies would have been impacted. From the time that the evacuation order was called on April 8th, then our officers, the, the plan the emergency response plan for our ministry was activated, whereby we had our home help for the elderly providers on board, our community development officers on board, who went out to the different districts to assist with the evacuation of these persons and so forth, in terms of having accurate information. And through this um, crisis, we were able to develop a, um, a database we have been able to establish a data and call center at NEMO's headquarters where we were able to capture information not only on the evacuees but also their household composition and their, their needs basically. So as at the 26th of um, May, the statistics as to the displaced persons were over 18,000 persons and uh, it's broken up basically those who are in public shelters, private shelters and rented accommodation through the Ministry of Tourism and Culture. And from what we're seeing um, in terms of the data, comparative data, um, the composition in the public shelters, we see more males in public shelters, but in the private shelters, more females, over 60% in the private shelters. And of the... Probably the elderly as well. The elderly, the elderly. We had to provide special accommodation for them, either through the Lewis Burnett um, home, or the, we had to convert the Dr. J.P. Eustace as an emergency shelter into a geriatric um, facility for those elderly persons or those disabled persons who require more constant or direct attention from our home health providers. And given, again, with COVID, the global pandemic, you have to look at vulnerable groups in a special kind of way. Yes. Especially um, the elderly who may have um, underlying conditions, conditions yes. and something must be put in place for them to be in a healthier space. Yeah, most definitely. And we are in a crisis whereby we say a, a triple threat. You know, we still have the, um, the dengue fever. We can never forget that we still have that, although we're seeing the rates of infection going down. We still have COVID-19 and now we have the Lasso Frey volcano. So seeing, look at this, you have persons confined within a shelter that's maybe enclosed, which may have mosquitoes breeding, right? And now you have COVID-19 
So those are the, the, the different dynamics that we have to work against. The ministry has uh, distributed uh, dignity kits yes. to women in particular, and I think that is very important, seeing that, as you said, they had to move from their comfortable zone, you know, their residence. And so what was the inspiration behind the distribution of the dignity kits to the different shelters? Okay, well, this all stemmed from our relationship with our UN partners. Because as um, the Gender Affairs Division, being the national gender machinery within St. Vincent and the Grandines, we oftentimes um, do ongoing training with our partners and so forth to, to basically develop, our, our improve our capacity to respond to any crisis, right? So from the time that the diffusive eruption was announced, our partners reached out to us and provided support in terms of um, data collection tools, what to use, and from that, we would have developed a gender-based violence safety audit. It's an observation tool that we would have used from the, um, the 10th of April. We went out and did this assessment in mm. 85 shelters, whereby we observed the environment to determine the safety and protection needs and the risk to violence within the shelters. And from that, we were able to decide what to do next, what interventions to do. So with partnership from UN Women and also UNFPA, we were able to proposition or you know, receive some dignity tickets. We also were provided with food hampers and some um, personal protective equipment like masks and hand sanitizers to be able to distribute to persons within the shelters. We single out women, but we say women and families because disasters and crises, it exacerbates the vulnerabilities of women and it separates yeah. women and men. Because people would not often say um, men are affected as well. We know that everyone, we are affected. Disasters affects everyone. But you have to look in terms of who are most um, directly affected and to ensure that whatever interventions are provided that no one is left behind. So that's why you have to use your gender lens and see what are the different needs of women versus men, right? And then you are able to develop and implement your intervention plans. Well, that would definitely involve multiple or various assessments which are necessary to carry out um, the task to ensure that all populations are safe. Yes. Definitely. Yes. So after the distribution of the kits, what was the feedback that you received? Okay, well, thus far we have been concentrating mostly on public shelters because they are confined within a facility where we know where they are. Even though the percentage of persons in the public shelters are, are far less than private, we know the numbers there. So we decided that we would be able to distribute these items to the public shelters mm -hmm. and then provided that we have more dignity kits and resources we can be able to spread out to the private shelters but what we did and and thus far we did a, a distribution yesterday we have reached to close to 700 dignity kits um, being distributed we partnered with some of um, the CSOs the civil society organizations mm -hmm. who would have had names of persons in private shelters and we would have you know, provided them with some kits to distribute as well. That answered my next question in terms of the, the private shelters and how were these um, populations catered to? The whole aspect of reintegrating and returning, it also helps in terms of building back better. Because these persons know that if, they, if the government is to provide support to reconstruct or repair their homes, their homes will be built taking into consideration the building codes and it will be safe and so forth. So, so that's a plus as well. So the, those are lessons learned mm -hmm. that we should be able to take into consideration in moving forward. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Well, Ms. Kwame, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. You've definitely provided myself as well as the viewers with ample knowledge on what the ministry has been doing to help persons 
in these challenging times and to ensure that our nation is a much more secure place. So thank you very much for speaking with me today. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Welcome to Opportunity Calls, where we inform you on vacancies within the government service, opportunities for training, scholarships, and much more. Stay tuned as an opportunity might just be calling you. The World Bank invites applications from Latin America and the Caribbean for Inclusive Internship Program. The LCR Inclusive Internship Program is designed to introduce a diverse and inclusive group of qualified graduate students to the World Bank by offering hands-on opportunities to contribute to development work in the Latin American and Caribbean region. Selected candidates will be able to improve their own skills in a diverse environment dedicated to ending extreme poverty and boosting prosperity and will benefit from opportunities for onboarding and training, networking, mentoring, and coaching from the World Bank staff. The first cohort will consist of 16 internships starting mid-July to August 2021. Application closes June 25, 2021. For more information on how to apply, please visit our Facebook page at API SVG. As parents, we have the responsibility to ensure that our child or children are safe and ready for the reopening of school. In this phase of reopening, all confirmed cases of COVID-19 in St. Vincent and the Grenadines are imported or import-related with no community spread. However, while we strive to achieve some level of normalcy, we highly recommend adherence and compliance as we continue together to reduce the risk of viral illnesses like the flu and coronavirus. Talk to your child to reinforce what is expected of him or her during this time. Remind your child to wash their hands frequently with soap and running water. In the absence of such, a 70% alcohol-based hand sanitizer can be used. If both are absent, children are advised to keep their unwashed hands out of their eyes, nose, and mouth. Cover their nose and mouth when sneezing or coughing with a tissue and immediately dispose of it. In the absence of tissue, sneeze or cough into their elbow, not their hands. As parents, we also have a responsibility to ensure that your child or children's temperature is checked and recorded. If a temperature reading is 38 degrees Celsius or 100.1 degrees Fahrenheit and above, please call the COVID-19 hotline and a healthcare provider will advise you accordingly. If the reading is below, your child is good to go. During school, if they are unwell, they should report it to the teacher or parent immediately. If you or your child are experiencing any flu-like symptoms, please stay at home and call your nearest health center and share your history. A healthcare provider will talk you through the procedures to follow. Children who must take public transportation should wear face mask coverings en route, one for the morning journey and another for after school. The flu and coronavirus, COVID-19, can cause serious illnesses, even death. Please protect yourself and your family. Welcome back, you're viewing Iron Government. Our Latin American neighbors have contributed remarkably to the recovery efforts following the recent challenges faced by St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Recently, the United Mexican States donated two Mexican-made medical ventilators, 10,000 cans of tuna, and 18,000 masks to the government and people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The API's Nellis Cupid was at the handing over ceremony held at the Argyle International Airport and filed this report. The donation of ventilators and humanitarian aid from the United Mexican States to St. Vincent and the Grenadines was done through the Mexican Agency for International Development Cooperation, AMEXID, an agency of Mexico's foreign affairs. Joel Providence, Honorary Consul of Mexico, delivered remarks on behalf of the Embassy of Mexico to the Eastern Caribbean states and welcomed the Mexican delegation. I am pleased in my capacity to welcome the Mexican delegation headed by the Executive Director of the Mexican Agency for International Cooperation for Development, Dr. Laura Elena Carrillo-Cubillas. 
also including the General Director, Gloria Sandoval Salas, and her team, representatives from the Mexican Ministry of Defense, headed by Brigadier General Manuel Alejandro Velasco Villanueva. It is an honor for me to bear witness of another action of cooperation from Mexico aimed to support the development of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, which on this occasion is the donation of two Mexican-made medical ventilators, which will strengthen the St. Vincent Health System amid the COVID-19 pandemic and the valuable donation of humanitarian aid, which will help the government and people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines to address the fallout from the volcanic eruptions. In St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we remember with gratitude the construction of the Mexico St. Vincent and the Grenadines Friendship Bridge at Cumberland, financed by the Mexican government, which is a milestone of our cooperation and bilateral relations. Likewise, there have been very important trainings in which we have partnered in order to strengthen our respective capacities. From my side as Honorary Consul and as a Vincentian, I am honored to say that all these cooperative projects and actions demonstrate that Mexico, which by the way is the largest country in the Caribbean, is a reliable partner and an important cooperating country for the region and especially for St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And with these remarks, I say thank you to the Mexicans. The Mexican delegation was headed by Executive Director of the Mexican Agency for Development Cooperation, Dr. Laura Elena Carrillo Cubillas. Dr. Carrillo Cubillas brought greeting on behalf of the government and people of Mexico and expressed honor in being able to deliver aid to the government and people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. It has been more than a year since the health crisis derived from the COVID-19 pandemic. It, in August 2020, a few months after the pandemic reached the countries of Latin America and the Caribbean, in an event led by our foreign minister in which representatives of the governments of different countries of the region were present online thanks to technology, Mexico announced the donation of medical devices to help you face this unprecedented situation. Well, we want to say that we did it and we keep doing it. Our president, instructed us to support the countries of Latin America and the Caribbean that need it most. And that is why we are here today, in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, in our third day of deliveries that we have been making of these devices, and we still have some more countries to go. But we strongly believe that no nation can effectively address international challenges individually especially when we face global challenges such as the COVID-19 pandemic. This is the reason why all nations must be together to establish strong alliances of collaboration and advance together in international development cooperation actions. We want to emphasize that the medical respiration, medical devices we are delivering to you today were proudly manufactured with Mexican technology and were also adapted to the technical requirements of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We know that in addition to fulfilling the task entrusted to us by our president through the Mexican Agency for International Development Cooperation, we are helping to strengthen the capacities of your country's medical personnel to save lives. And this is our main goal. We would especially like to thank Joel Providence, Honorary Consul of Mexico and St. Vincent and the Grenadines and all his team for their invaluable support, coordinating efforts with the counterparts of this country. And of course, the team that I just mentioned earlier, which is the, the, the General Directorate of Mesoamerica Project for making possible this display of affection that further unites our nations. Dear friends of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we all have lost someone because of the COVID-19. And I want you to know that we are here for you. The people from Mexico send you these devices as a proof that we are sister nations helping each other.
Delivering remarks on behalf of the government, Senator the Honorable Kiesel Peters expressed thanks to the government and people of the United Mexican States for their kind of donation. Senator Peters said that given the different challenges the country is currently facing, the donations are timely and welcomed and will assist those most in need. On behalf of the government and people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, I take this opportunity to thank the government and people of the United Mexican States for their donation to the state of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. As we all know, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we are facing a multiplicity of challenges. We have our battle with the dengue fever, we have our battle with the COVID-19 pandemic, and within recent weeks, we have seen the wrath of the Lost Free Volcano. And these donations, namely the donation of the medical ventilators, is very much appreciated. These machinery, they are critical to the care that will be given to patients battling the COVID-19 pandemic. And we want to say once again, thank you. As it relates to the other donations of humanitarian aid and supplies, again, we are very much appreciative because they are timely, especially for the persons who have been displaced by the Lassifre volcano and are currently sheltered at our various emergency shelters across the country. Now, Mexico has always been a good friend to St. Vincent and the Grenadines. In fact, this July, we will be celebrating 31 years of diplomatic relations, and that is a remarkable, remarkable thing. And over the 30 years, St. Vincent and the Grenadines and Mexico, we have worked together in many respects, on many fronts, on a bilateral front, as well as multilateral in organizations such as the United Nations, the Organization of American States, and the Association of Caribbean States. In fact, we concluded that meeting um, within the last week, where St. Vincent and all the other member states convened for a meeting, a very timely meeting, given what is happening globally. And Mexico, as well, is a friend to CARICOM. Apart from St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Mexico has been working with other CARICOM countries in areas of agriculture, health, infrastructure. And the, the evidence of the help with infrastructure um, could be seen from the Cumberland Rehabilitation Project, which came about as a result of the 2013 Christmas straw flood. And I'm sure we all in St. Vincent and the Grenadines remember that it was a very devastating experience, loss of life, loss of property. And the Mexican government donated 500,000 US dollars, which was utilized for the Cumberland Housing Rehabilitation Project. So these are examples of the work and the diplomacy between our two nations. And it is, it is just, as I say, you know, I have this saying, it's good to have good friends in bad times. And once again, Mexico is here to assist the state of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So once again, I take this opportunity on behalf of the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and on behalf of the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines to say thank you to your team. And I, I specifically remember when the diplomatic note came across my desk regarding the interest of Mexico to donate these ventilators and how excited I was because we know what is happening globally in terms of hoarding medical equipment, vaccines. We know what is happening, but it's good that we have good friends who can assist us. And I immediately brought the matter to the attention of the Honorable Prime Minister, who was very much on board in receiving the ventilators. And we also got in touch with the Ministry of Health, the technical persons, and they worked with the Mexican manufacturer to ensure that the ventilators would fit the specifications for St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And if that is not commitment, I don't know what is. So once again, I want to thank the government of the United Mexican States 
for this donation and we look forward to working with Mexico in the future and thank you very much. The Mexican Agency for International Development's Cooperation Priority Areas of Development Cooperation are Education, Health, Environment and Climate Change, and Science and Technology. Its geographic priorities are Central America, the rest of Latin America and the Caribbean, and the developing countries of Asia Pacific and Africa. Stop the spread of viral infections including the flu and COVID-19 by practicing proper hand washing. Follow these simple steps. Remove all jewelry before washing hands. Wet hands using running water. Place liquid soap in hand. Circulate using rotational movements, interlace fingers, and repeat switching hands. Wash back of fingers, rotating them in the palms. Wash fingertips, rotating them in palms. Wash thumbs using rotational movements. Thoroughly wash hands down to the wrist. Rinse hands. Dry with clean tissue. Turn off tap using tissue. Use tissue to open door and discard in bin. A simple act can make a huge difference. Stop the spread of viral infections including the flu and COVID-19 by practicing proper hand washing. This is a message from the Ministry of Health, Wellness and the Environment. Welcome back. When it comes to dance, the art form is sometimes underestimated. Its value as a major contributor to cultural development is underrated. During a virtual dance conference on Saturday, June 5th, a number of issues related to dance as a prolific art form were highlighted, including the physical benefits of dance, its use as a teaching tool, and the need for instructors to seek higher education. In this segment, the API's Barvin Oliver details key areas of this important exercise. Some describe it as the movement of the body in a rhythmic way. Others describe it as a performing art consisting of sequences of movement, either improvised or purposefully selected. This movement has aesthetic or often symbolic value. Whatever the description, this art is well known for assisting persons to overcome personal challenges and be the best version of themselves. Given the current challenges faced by this country due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the volcanic eruption of April 9th, many persons have used various forms of the arts to describe the impacts of these challenges while at the same time entertaining a nation. With this in mind, the Ministry of Tourism, Civil Aviation, Sustainable Development and Culture hosted a virtual dance conference dubbed SVG Shall Rise, Resilience of Our Artists on Saturday, June 5th. The conference brought together a wide cross-section of dance stakeholders who discussed various topics, including dance techniques, the benefits of dance on youth, and the need for higher education. Highlighting the benefits of dance was former dance development officer and former head of the dance unit Anne-Marie Venner, who said the art form can do wonders for one physically. Through dance, children can gain a multitude of important developments, sensory and spatial awareness, coordination, concentration, and mobility. But more than this, we use it to express emotions, increase confidence, or even just to make ourselves feel better. And I know my the, the first two speakers would have touched on little things we, we, uh, related to, to, to this. So I ask the question, why is it important to learn the basic skills in dance? Dance teaches children about music, rhythm, and beat. Students also have a better understanding of spatial relationships and learn to think with both sides of their brain. All these skills enhance a child's academic performance as well as their physical well-being. Vena added that dance can be used as a teaching tool for students. You see, like we have the pandemic, we have the, the COVID, we have the, the dengue, we have the volcano. An artist who understands 
how to take all these things that are happening and put them into one um, choreography and put it on stage, will know how to get to the heart of the observer and teach them, let them understand what is happening. Because sometimes people learn from seeing other people do things. You might be telling them something and they don't get it, you don't get it. But when you put something together and you put you stage that, they sit back and they fully understand. And based on their experience, what they're exposed to, they are with it. So dance education, do not take it slightly. You don't feel it's okay to just go and do what you feel like because, oh, I have to go and do dances. No, 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 no. Do it properly. I know what I wanted in, in life. I knew that I wanted to be a good dancer. And to be a good dancer, you have to have the knowledge. It's like any subject areas because you can teach maths, science, geography, history using dance. So that could be your, your, your topic. Um, history class this morning for my dance students. You have them understanding the history of these dancing from whatever country. You have them dressing according to these dance, how they, their, their costume. So they understand it, they feel it, they, they, they're feeling it. You look at the geography, geographic location of these, uh, these dances, you know, you look at the function of this dance, why this function. So, so when your child sit in your living room and looking at something on television, pretending to dance, the child can relate. They understand what is happening. So, as I said, dance education. She said persons wishing to teach the art form should seek higher education. There's a lot of things that you have to know when you're going into the school to teach your children. Fine. If you're just going to the school to teach dance technique, that is good. Build up with persons um, physical, physically. But if you want to deal with the mind you have to know what you're teaching because they have, trust me, they have some children who are very smart. They will ask you a question. If you're not a show, they will ask you a question. How, how will you look like a fool not knowing what to tell them? No, you're there to guide them. So you have to know how to implement your, your, your lesson in order to deliver it the way you think will best serve your student and know that learning is taking place. So you have the appreciation. Once you understand, you appreciate your, your, um, your, your culture more and they have more respect for it. So I'm saying to all those dance enthusiasts who want to study dance, yes, they enjoy it not because they're performing and all that, but not everybody want to study, not, not everybody want to teach, you just want to perform. But if you want to teach, I think you should go a little further and obtain the certification and have all the knowledge so that you could help other young minds to move on and to make decisions as to what they want in life and choose career that, uh, you know, that they will love. Also discussing issues relating to education was the founder and artistic director for Bal Creole, an art school in Toronto, Patrick Parson who challenged the idea that higher education is needed in order to teach dance. I want to look at technique and there's technique, dance technique is natural. It's natural. We don't have to always look at the codified stuff and say, this is a technique, because it's a natural phenomenon for moving, jumping, bending, running from birth. You know, so we don't have to go to an institute to learn that because it's natural in the body. You don't need a certification to do that because it's in the body. You know, I only get it later on because the society recognized that, but we don't need it because our body is designed to move and jump and twist and bend in all forms. So we have to give respect for that first. And if we don't give respect for that first, we will have a problem understanding dance in its entirety, okay? Because when I was growing up, when people talk about technique, oh, they need to do a batman and a split. Today, it's not about that. It's about understanding how the body works and it controls itself. 
There's technique that has come naturally. The pandemic has created difficulties for persons within the creative sector, reducing opportunities for individuals to perform and make a living. As such, some persons made full use of streaming technology to perform before their audience. Discussions were had as it relates to this technology and the challenges associated with its use. I'm trying to answer the question in the context of how can more happen? Because for me, I had a Cuban tutor um, and the impression on me and on my dance, I was speaking to a colleague about just yesterday, the, the discipline, the artistry, the extending yourself. Um, um, I think Mr. Parsons was mentioned or Ms. Venner phrase about the, the stress on the body, the stress on the body for, for positive results. Um, so I think in terms of exporting, it is meeting more people and on a micro level, just making exchanges. Um, on a la larger basis, we have to start looking at institutions. So institutions bringing people down. We have a Cuban embassy and they, um, we've had some Venezuelan dancers and then how can we, because we still have to deal with international regulations. So how do we bridge those ga gaps to collaborate and collaborate with people in the performing arts at this time you know, um, we have to talk about the monetary part of it. How are we going to accomplish that? You know, for this virtual um, conference, you know, we were asked to give our time and we did it willfully. But in a performance context, where you videotaping stuff and working with people over a period of time, how will we compensate people for their time to do that kind of work? So those are the things we have to look at the language barrier between the French and the English speaking, um, the platform that Cuba don't have regular access to for streaming and, and conferencing. You know, yes, you can, use, you can use Facebook, but Facebook does not do what these other platforms can do. Google Meet is good because I, I use Google Meet for the public schools here in, in Ontario and it works. So we have a lot of learning to do, it's a learning curve, right? The other thing is that if the collaboration is one thing, but I, I noticed that even teaching, teaching on Zoom, passing on information is a more complex, getting the nuances of movement. So we have to deal with that. Reporting for the API, I am Bavin Oliver. I never knew we can travel in the OECS Economic Union with any government ID. Cooks, cooks coming, cooks coming. The Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, OECS, in celebration of their 40th anniversary, presents OECS for Me, a special Chekapesh production. I got all your shopping. You have your lamb leg, you have your steak, you have salmon, and your caviar. But I forgot the bread. Here's $500 to buy your bread, Iglesia. But I am traveling tomorrow for a meeting in Antigua. I knew this. You're not going to Antigua without me. I am going by Sikorin to get some suitcases. In your dreams, I am taking your passport. Saturday, June 12th at 7 p.m. on the OECS YouTube channel. I love Antigua. Antigua has good food and Sunday, June 13th at 3 p.m. on the OECS Facebook page. Can my partner and I share a table with you? Sure. <laughs> this production is co-funded by the 11th European Development Fund Regional Integration Through Growth Harmonization and Technology Right Project. Coming up on this week's Inside Story, World Blood Donor Day. Every job counts. Meet the team at Planned Parenthood. Recognizing young talent at Stennett Joinery. These exciting stories await you on Inside Story, Saturday, June 12, 2021, on SVG TV at 5 p.m. Save the date. Thanks for staying tuned to Iron Government. 
Recovery from a disaster is usually a gradual process. In the process of getting St. Vincent and the Grenadines back to a state of normalcy, a donation of recovery supplies was recently added to the efforts complements the American Consulate. The API's Yinka Chambers tells us more in this report. As St. Vincent and the Grenadines moves from the relief to the recovery stages, the assistance and support of people in the diaspora has yet again come to the fore. This as the Consulate of New York facilitated the transport and consequent handing over of supplies to aid in the recovery process. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs supported the handing over to the National Emergency Management Organization, NEMO, to aid in the return to normalcy of families displaced as a result of the explosive eruptions of La Soufre. On hand to accept the donations was Deputy Director of NEMO, Kenson Studdard, who expressed gratitude for the supplies and noted that this will assist with the efforts already being made by the government to transition people back to their homes. I know persons in the diaspora have been keeping abreast with the developments on the ground since the explosive eruption of the Asafir volcano. I know that you are far away. But I know that you have been, um, your hearts, your minds, um, have been with your families and friends back home in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And uh, we are really grateful for that support. Um, we, we have been going through a tough time, um, challenging time. But I really am here to say that we have responded and we have, it has provided us with an opportunity to show our resilience. And uh, I think that is what is coming to the fore um, each day. We see our systems developing. We see how our, our methods improving as, as we continue to provide for those persons that are affected. And by and large, the entire country has been affected. But um, we stand resolute and we will continue to, to show resolve. And uh, we really appreciate the, this this uh, this gesture, and we look forward to continued relations with our diaspora. It's really pleasing to see the diaspora um, so heavily involved, and we look forward to those relations. And we hope that we will have your support through the entire process. I know that you you you're there, and know that you care, and um, hopefully um, this would go a long way in returning Vincent and John's and Saint Vincent and the Grenadines back to a state of normalcy. Thank you. On behalf of Nemo and the Ministry of National Security. Um, I really want to say a heartfelt thank you to the diaspora community. Minister of State with Responsibility for Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade, the Honorable Kisal Peter stated her delight at the generosity of individuals and organizations in the diaspora and thanked the consulate for their contributions to the overall recovery thrust. Many, many persons in the diaspora reached out to me inquiring how can I assist. Many reached out to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade as well. And I saw the efforts. I saw the efforts on social media where many persons in the diaspora rallied, mobilized, and they had everything together to send to their brothers and sisters in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And I want to say and join with Mr. Studdard to offer a heartfelt thank you because it shows that although you are not here, you are with us in spirit, that you took the time to put all of these relief items together and to send it to St. Vincent and the Grenadines to help us in this phase. And if I may be permitted just to highlight the organizations by name who are responsible for these relief items, we have SVG Relief USA Inc. We have the Council of St. Vincent and the Grenadines organization in the USA. We have SVG Drip. We have Friends of Crown Heights. We also want to thank the Standard Shippers for shipping a 40-foot container to SVG free of cost. Square Deal Shippers for shipping a 40-foot container to SVG free of cost. And Standard Caribbean Shippers for also shipping a 40-foot container to SVG free of cost. 
We also wish to highlight the alliance with the mayor's office, the American Red Cross, and UPS, who I believe is responsible for this shipment coming to St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So we want to thank you. So these supplies, as I said, they are well received and they are very much appreciated. And once again, I wish to thank the diaspora for coming to our aid and for still rallying with us. We love you, we appreciate you, and we thank you very much. Among the items donated to the recovery efforts are power washers, hoses, wet vacuums, cots, wheelchairs, also nebulizers and other medical supplies that will be distributed to all clinics across the country. I am Yinka Chambers for the API's Ion Government. The public is asked to take note of the following announcement. All traffickers exporting agricultural produce to Trinidad and Tobago are asked to note that the vessel Admiral Bay 1 will be departing Kingston Port on Monday 14th, June 2021 at 3.30 p.m. sharp. This is due to the current curfew in effect in Trinidad and Tobago. The Embassy of the United Mexican States to the Eastern Caribbean States is sending out a call for the drawing contest for children 2021 under the theme, This is my Mexico, the independence of Mexico. Girls and boys from all over the world are invited to participate and demonstrate their artistic skills and imagination by drawing or painting aspects moments, individuals, and historical scenes of Mexico's independence. The contest is open for children between 6 and 14 years old, and the drawings along with the registration forms can either be submitted digitally, JPEG or PNG, via email to the Embassy of Mexico at mexicanembassy at candw.lc or handed in at the Mexican Embassy. For more information on how to enter, please visit our Facebook page at API SVG. That's all we have for this presentation of Iron Government by the Agency for Public Information. If you missed any of our programs and want to catch up, please visit us on our social media platforms. Do join us again on Saturday for our Inside Story. Have a good night. I'm Hala John.